Clock, we'll get started. We've got a couple, uh, we got the sheriff and animal shelter on board. What I would like to do is, uh, I'm sure most people have heard, if not, uh, we lost one of our own today, uh, Mr. Rick Richardson. I think everybody is aware of that, but uh, Mr. Richardson had passed, I think, about 7 o'clock this morning. Thank Andy for letting everyone know. Uh, we'd like uh, to thank his family and Rick. He served us well for the, the short time he was on here. I know he's passionate about the, what he did. And he, Serving. So uh, I want to start off with a moment of silence and ask Mr. Campbell if he'll say a prayer for us right after work.
Stop the jail. 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 On the sheriff's side, it shows an increase right now of $195,374.24. Uh, what we also have on that side is, is an additional $221,000 in recognized revenue on the federal inmate surplus monies that we are asking to be recognized into the budget this year, along with $23,200 in, in SSA funds. <coughs> Also note on that bottom line there is a, also a thirty-eight thousand dollar increase for the additional SRO uh, that we picked up mid-year. So if you look at the hundred ninety-five thousand dollars, and then you see that you recognize the two hundred twenty-one thousand dollars in the federal inmate surplus, the twenty-three-two in SSA, and then uh, take into account the thirty-eight thousand dollars in the mid-year requirement on the SRO, there's actually, we're actually in the black about $86,000 on that line. Those are real numbers as far as the recognized revenues and the additional requirement uh, accounting against the increase. On the jail side, we are looking at a $372,593 increase, but we also ask to recognize in federal inmate revenue on that side as well. And, uh, that should leave a balance of $151,000, $593 increase on the jail side. If you, if you balance the two out, taking into consideration the additional SR, it's essentially a $64,000, $64,767 increase. You add that $38,000 in for the SRO, which is over $100,000 bottom line. That's bottom line. The $221,000 in additional federal inmate revenue that we're asking to be recognized on both sides, and that's for a total of $442,000. Uh, we are asking to apply that money against the, the comp and overtime line that we're asked to set four cents on this year. And I think both of those lines are, are 187 lines on each, each side. It would be 54, 110, 187, and 54, 210, 187. I think it's on overtime. That's what it would be. from the Social Security uh, Administration for giving them information to identify inmates that have uh, that are incarcerated that are currently receiving SSI or SSA benefits. They in turn turn those benefits off, to make sure there's not fraudulent distribution on them of the inmates' money, and they in turn give the, the county it's roughly two to four hundred dollars per inmate uh, once they are recognized. This year, we're looking at around $23,200 uh, coming in for that amount. We we are asking you to recognize that money and then apply it against our revenue line. And those are the monies that we traditionally spend on the uh, rental of the uh, the TCAT site on Arnie Hill rentals of uh, I guess copiers and that kind of. That's pretty much what's in that one. Uh, any, I'm going to ask a dumb question if that's okay. But, Absolutely. Uh, why are you dropping your medical insurance? 146 grand. That would be, I would defer that to Brad. Brad, we work very closely with Brad. And Brad is largely responsible for the health of the budget that we've got as far as getting a <coughs> presenting a 
real budget to the commission without a lot of love. And I think those are those are real numbers based on what he's seeing right now. Is it just less people buying into it, or no? When you compare it to the what's what I estimate to be the actual case this year, yeah. 2019, there was just a twenty thousand dollar increase, but the budget was uh, for Bellevue Church last year was too high. Gotcha. Understand. Oh, so it's five twenty-two, and essentially what happens is we hire. Them. Make sure our state is correct. We hire individuals, a lot of individuals that are in the National Guard, Army Reserves, Air Force Reserves, and they they tend to take that insurance over the county insurance. I think that whenever it was budgeted in the past, it was budgeted that every single individual in the county would take in the county sheriff's office would take that insurance. But when you have some individuals that de that decline, it, then it, it results in the savings. Is that accurate, Brett? So that's. That's how Brad was able to help us uh, see that savings. It's, it's, a lot of that's, we do get benefits by hiring, you know, national board members. Understood, thank you. Uh, Chief, what's the number of employees that you have over there? We have 130. We have roughly 15 part-timers and just a handful of reservists. Roughly 57 on the jail side and the balance on the patrol side. Not the same on the patrol side, but about a half a dozen um, administrative staff. And Fifteen, sir. Are you still seeing a high turnover in the jail? We are, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. <clears throat> we anticipate that those numbers are going to fare up and have fare up uh, whenever we get into. Uh, I guess the PowerPoint presentation that I've laid out, I've kind of talked to that and the, and the effects that we've seen. And we've seen very positive effects in the past whenever the County Commission acts on the cost of living allowances. And I'll kind of talk through those years and the numbers. It's it's kind of striking. We believe that there's definitely an effect uh, felt whenever we do get a cost of living allowance. Are the, are the turnover rates due to the pay or are they due to, this is not my area, to be because of what they don't know about? There's a little bit of both. The ones that decide that it's not their cup of tea, normally they, they leave within the first 30 days. And we we largely, we, we address that by inviting them to come in and do uh, uh, job shadows and let them do a 12-hour shift or as many 12-hour shifts as they want to volunteer for uh, before they actually come on active service. And that has helped and that's that's slowed it down a bit, but we have seen a few this year. They come in and they'll work a couple of weeks, and <clears throat> they don't really like the the doors shutting behind them or some of the clientele that they can deal with. Sometimes it's family pressure. What would you say your turnover rate is on road officers and, and SROs this year? It's substantially lower than it is on the uh, on the jail side. Jail side is where, of course, it's a little lower, a little lower pay, and that's. That's the entry side, uh, but on the patrol side, we're seeing around four to five a year, and that's roughly, I say, ten to ten to twelve percent if you if you count in the uh, SROs. You mentioned patrol. Uh, how many cars or people are out there on the road <laughs> at the time as well? Each each primary shift has four deputies. We have a power shift of 10 deputies uh, plus a couple of part-timers. So we, the power shift works during the, the peak times of calls for service. So whenever we have the peak calls for service, you can see as many as nine to 10 deputies working on the road and then say four or five in the morning, you only see four on the road because we don't have that many calls for service at that time. And the chair confused me a little bit on the eight tenths of one percent on the salary increase. That was, I think he was talking about the, the total budget the total, overall. The total with two and a half percent pay increase including the increase. In, in the in the budget that you have in front of you is a two and a half percent cost of living allowance across the board because I think that were, that was the general direction that we thought that we'd received earlier in the year, so that's that's in there. 
and I think the uh, it depends on how you look at the total increase on the budget. It's going to, it's going to be around between 8.8, 09 percent overall by uh, Brad's, uh, Brad's numbers. I uh, maybe I think that's what the variance is. Uh, going through, I guess, specific lines uh, of note because there's a lot of up and down in the budget, and that's largely due to Brad getting everything in the correct lines. And it's been a little bit of a painful process because this is a new, and, and I really appreciate what he's doing, new budgeting uh, initiative, getting everything in the right lines so we can track it and, and uh, you know, look, I guess, execute it correctly. Um, so you'll see a lot of up and down, but the, the lines that you'll see the biggest change in, the ones that we see the, the change, of course, Line 54, 110, 170 is the additional SRO. And if you count uh, the additional SRO plus this benefit, it's going to be around $37,000, $38,000. That's what this case is. On the overtime pay, we already talked about what overtime pay is, and I'll address it again. It's, it's essentially the comp time that they approve each patrol deputy and each jail deputy approves 12 hours of comp time. Per 28-day cycle, just by essence of the essence of the schedule that they work, um, and they have the holidays, which we have 13 and 14 holidays a year. That's included in that. We did put a little bit of extra money into it this year. It will not be that high next year because there's still about 76 to 80 thousand dollars on what the number is right now. An unfunded liability on comp time is kind of hanging out there. So we put $40,000 extra on each side and asked to have that revenue recognized uh, to pay it down, to get us down to where we have little or no unfunded liability on the overtime comp, comp time side. Because the county commission has allowed us to use those monies to pay the comp time and the holidays, you know, starting there around mid-year, what you will know on our side is there's not near as much comp time or overtime that has accrued. And what you will also see is additional deputies on the street because they're not being forced to take that comp time off as days off in lieu of work in the same way in the jail. We have more jailers on duty. Um, talk about the Reynolds line. Yeah, that was, that was one that I was about to ask about. The Reynolds line, uh, the, that's where we're asking for the $23,000 Social Security Administration monies to be recognized in that pays for the the Arnie Hill uh, Tennessee Center for Applied Technologies rental that we have. That's where we have a classroom. We keep our our AT, ATVs and those types of vehicles stored up there along with anything else that needs to be stored. But we use it for our primary primarily for our summer end services every year plus storage. Um, we are considering, or they have approached us, we haven't really got into the assessment yet of providing an SRO for them at their campus up here on Stony Creek. You know, they would provide the revenue to pay for that, you know, much like Latalga provides us revenue to provide a, a deputy out there. Once we get into that negotiation, we believe that that, that, uh, that monthly rental will go away some consideration because we will provide we will provide them a, an SRO if that's an agreement that we can all come to but they're gonna have to pay you know actual costs all the way around for us to even consider that and we hope to get considerations on the round. Um, medical and jail side there is an increase uh, Captain Smith had largely kept that the same for the past five years. I think five years ago it was around 414,000. This year is up to I think 473. But that's the first. <clears throat> I think it is increased incrementally from five years ago to 414. So even at 473 thousand dollars, it's still pretty pretty reasonable. That said, Captain Smith is negotiating with them very hard and has put out an RFP out on the street to look for uh, other other providers to see if we can get a better deal. So even though it did increase, there is an RFP on the street for uh, an additional solicitation. And so that's the on-site contractor? 
Why? Well, I'm looking for Correct. Yep. Okay. Chief Beck on the share on the motor vehicles, 105,000. What's been asked for? I mean, pretty good. Level one three. Now on the fleet, we've we've been really fortunate and we've been really blessed with what the county commission has done over the past few years and some of the uh, the money that we've been able to use as far as option lines where we sell off old stuff and then pull it back over and pay for new, new vehicles. Um, I can tell you that four and a half years ago, the average mileage on a frontline cruiser was 160,000 miles. Today, it's 51,000 miles. Uh, the capability has increased. Uh, the cruiser four and a half years ago was primarily a two-wheel drive crown bit with a radio in it. You know, maybe or maybe not a camera, and there were a few radars. Now they're fully equipped. They come. <coughs> the new vehicles are the Dodge Charger all-wheel drive. Uh, they come equipped with the 10A camera system. They come equipped with the radars. They come equipped with laptops. Uh, we provide stop sticks. We provide the back shields, the, the, the bullet-resistant shields. Uh, we provide the. Uh, uh, breaching tools. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very, very well equipped vehicle. Um, you know, that, that gives the, it's like a carpenter needs good tools to be able to do their job. The deputy needs the tools to be able to do their job. So it's, it's probably the most comprehensively equipped patrol vehicle in East Tennessee. Our fleet mileage, I would compare it against any, any department, large or small, Knoxville up. I mean, you, you can look on the, on the news and see the the struggles that say Sullivan County is currently having with their fleet and the numbers of vehicles that they're having to bring in. We've been able to reduce the mileage and replace just about every vehicle in the fleet over the past couple of years by just proper fleet management. Uh, there may be, and I can tell you with three, uh, we'll sustain that 50, 50 couple thousand mile average this year. Uh, there may be an, an out year you know, two to three years out where we may need an extra couple of vehicles, but I'll address that here in just a second as far as future requirements and a way to uh, a way to fund that without having to come back for, for base funding. The only other significant increase that you'll see is on food. Uh, Tom also has RFPs out on food. There has been some uh, confusion on the current vendors that we're using. We believe the prices are a little a little too high compared to uh, other locations, even in North Carolina and over in Washington County. So there's an RFP out right now for the, the primary vendors on those food stuffs. We know on that pretty accurate number. The idea, an accurate number on that. One. What's that kind of thing? Well, we're going to go with what we've got is there as an accurate number. Uh, we believe that with what Captain Smith does and what Captain Trivet does on the jail side, we targeted that number because it went up a good bit this, this year. We came in on budget last year. <clears throat> so I'm not exactly sure other than vendor, vendor issues, which we didn't know until about a month and a half ago, um, you know, why those, why those numbers are up because our average daily population is, it was high a little, it was a little high earlier in the year. We were around the 330 mark. You know, today we're around 276. So I understand additional inmates are going to eat additional food, but the numbers monthly are still a bit high. So we're, that's what why Captain Smith is hacking that with an with an RFP and uh, Captain Trivis looking at what he's going to plant in the garden this year. That's what I think he's in the garden. How's that work? In the past, it's worked really well. I mean, primarily it's um, like Captain Smith's potato crops up until the last couple of years. He, 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 he doesn't farm potatoes anymore, but he could easily fill the majority of this, the floor of this room with what he would bring in. Uh, the bottom lines down there are pretty good for those types of crops. The compensation area, what is how does that work as far as I know? Where's the, the excess money 
commissary monies are normally split up with what they collect. They'll collect monies that should go back to the, the medical side. Uh, and the amounts that we collect on the commissary, it's been going to a reserve account. It's been accruing in a, a reserve account. And we most recently used, <coughs> excuse me, the allergies are killing me this year. We most recently used the um, commissary reserve account for the drains. I believe what we used it for. I have to go back and look at the amendment. But we use it, whatever money's accrued there, we we use it for improvements on the jail. Uh, whenever the inmates flooded, I don't know, four or five months ago, we were reminded that there were not drains in the jail and why somebody would build a, a facility that side without size without drains in the floors. Uh, we spent $24,000, dollars to put drains in the floors, and that's where that money, that's where that excess revenue is. Uh, I know we also use monies for the uh, pie hole locks, I don't know if it was the, the drains or the locks that we used to do. Do you remember Thomas? Yeah, right. Okay, we can just get a small portion of that. <coughs> Probably the profit goes to TV and all this. But we have increased the uh, amount of revenue coming in from the commissary side, and that's something that we targeted for this year. We are assessing whether or not we can take over the commissary. Uh, we believe that that would probably quadruple the amount of revenue that would, it would bring in. Um, and there's you know some concerns with the Tennessee Blind Enterprises, how they operate the commissary versus the way the county would operate the commissary. And that's still in, in discussions with the county attorney and we're still studying that. Uh, that said, we're still going after them as far as we've increased the amount of, that's charged on an order from $2 to $3. I think so that, that's increased by 50%. And we've noted that <coughs> TBE has singularly contracted with a company called Vendinch, which manages the inmate revenue that comes in whenever uh, a mother or father or uh, significant other comes in and puts money on an inmate's account. Uh, they put it on on a system called Vendinch, which then is managed by the inmate, spent by the inmate for their commissary items or for their medical uh, treatment, that kind of thing. Uh, we believe that the county should contract with Vendinch and should have that contract and we should gain any revenue that potentially is going to the, to the commissary vendor, which we think that that revenue should return to the county. And that third price is across from items that they purchased this month. Yes. I, I, approved, I, I approved what can be purchased. Uh, they, they approved the, the price. And it's, it's reasonable. It's, 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 it's a hard conversation, a little bit as bad as I have to have. So. That revenue has increased from about $18,000. Uh, four to five years ago, I think this year, Brad said it was around 42000 on the last year. So it's increased. We expect it to increase a little bit more next year. We expect by putting an RFP out for the uh, the Vendinch services, maybe Vendinch gets it, maybe somebody else gets it, whoever gives the greatest consideration for the county and provides the best services for the inmate will be selected, brother. Now, we believe that the county should select that individual. We don't have any more questions specifically on the budget. Of course, we can return to the budget. <clears throat> I'd like for you to, to consider the uh, PowerPoint presentation I laid out for you today. Just to kind of let you understand how we go through our planning, programming, budgeting, budgeting, and execution cycle. You know, we come to you for the budgeting, but we are responsible for the planning and programming you know, portion of the budget to make sure that we have enough to execute the primary duties for lines of effort that the sheriff you know, has stated that we accomplished during the year. But I think that the, the Budget Committee and the County Commission need to, you need, need to understand you know, what you're getting for the monies that you spent last year, what you, what you should expect for the monies that are going to be budgeted and spent for next year. <clears throat> if you look at the, the first page, major lines of effort, the sheriff has designated that, that we concentrate on safety, 
community safe schools and, and maintaining a safe, secure, and sanitary jail. Now, what, what you get out of safe communities, the, the strategies that we're working is we're working very hard to remove the woman persons from your neighborhood. And really what that means is that service or arrest forms. Uh, and what that really means is that once those individuals are removed from the community, we believe there's less likelihood of them to continuing, you know, the petty crimes that they commit, you know, as they attempt to, uh, I guess, avoid, you know, avoid apprehension. So you'll see the removing the one person from your neighborhoods as a, as a primary task, increase in presence and capabilities of the patrol deputies, a comprehensive counter-narcotics effort, and aggressively pursuing crimes against children as an ICAC task, participating in the uh, ICAC task force uh, that's basically centered in Knoxville. And that's a new Mission Essential Task Force this year, and I'll talk about the main training and equipping of that here in just a second. Um, safe schools, that's basically increased safety. And the county commission and the school department, I cannot brag on enough, you all have led the way in the state. Uh, everybody else is just now following suit as far as placing school resource officers in the, in the county schools. <clears throat> and this is well, well before anything happened in Florida or anything happened anywhere else. You were not reactive, you were proactive. Talk about the county school systems and the county commission both because it's, it's really a collaborative effort and you share uh, you share the you know the burden on paying for this you know, the, the county schools pay for roughly 10 uh, the county commission you know provides the, the funding for roughly six of them so this it's a collaborative effort um, we also have been able to, to fund the Raptor Visitor Management System and hopefully a, a new system that we're assessing right now, uh, largely out of the Sex Offender Registry monies. That's another reserve account. Um, and they also, the school resource officers, because they're, this is kind of a new concept. Whenever you have a school resource officer that's in each school, they become really that community officer because the parents are seeing that individual every day, the, the children are seeing that individual every day. It's community policing in its truest form. You may see it as a school resource officer, we see it as a community officer, because <coughs> you really break the county down into, into 15 individual little small areas. And I'm, not, I'm not counting the, the SROs that they have in the, in the city system. So this is an extremely valuable asset. We've been able to leverage that asset to also on their way home check on some of the elderly that do not have anybody to check on them. It's called the elder care program. So it's it's really it's it's really a force multiplier. Whenever you have that individual in the communities, it's you have that recognizable face, and we believe that they're much more approachable. And they will say, well, we've got concerns about an elderly male or female that lives in our community. They don't have any family. Their family has moved away or or they just may not tend to them. <clears throat> and we, so we, we really appreciate what you've done. It, I think it's, it's had an impact much larger than what you realize. The Safe, Secure, and Sanitary Jail. Um, we have a larger strategy that kind of starts at the top as far as uh, the way crime is addressed. And it's really, really no more elaborate or no more uh, intellectual than we turn the light on the individuals that have the active arrest more so after they're committing crimes. We chase them, we grab them by the tail, we finish them off in a court of law while they're waiting for adjudic adjudication. Um, we place them in as a safe, secure, and sanitary jail as they can stand it. And as a result, we're seeing a very, very real, that's just a very base strategy, we're seeing a very, very real decrease in reported crime. It's been a 25% decrease in reported crime over the past couple of years. That's a big deal. That's something that you can't or we can't put a dollar amount to or a real value against somebody that did not get victimized. But whenever a family sleeps soundly in their, in their home at night knowing that somebody, <clears throat> you know, that they're not worried because somebody didn't rifle through, through the car because they left it on lock because they're out there trying to find whatever they can find to trade for methamphetamine or they didn't suffer a residential burglary, or they didn't suffer 
you know, some other type of theft, it's a big deal. So the, the funding, you know, of, of these major programs, it, it's, you're seeing a real, a real difference. And you'll see it on the next page, which is crimes reported. And these crimes, this is based on real powers reporting. And what you'll see over the base four years before the average to where we're at now, you'll see a 25% decrease in total crimes reported. You'll see a 22% decrease in total property crimes. A significant 59% decrease in residential burglaries and a 66% decrease in auto burglaries. So what that means is whenever you're, you're funding these deputies that are out there on this power shift or the individuals that are pursuing the individuals you know, that have these active arrest warrants and then whenever they're placed in a safe, secure, in a, in a, a safe, secure, and sanitary jail as they can stand it and they're quickly and efficiently adjudicated over in court systems, the transients that are out there committing these petty crimes tend to move on. And that's, that's what you're seeing. Um, the next page you'll see arrest warrant service. And it's essentially a 77% decrease in active arrest warrants that we have on hand. And that's because you know, we're arresting roughly 3,000 a year of these individuals. Um, <clears throat> there's a very real efficiencies and effectiveness that come in the court systems that allow this I'll eventually get to it what you're seeing over on Patty's side and over on the judge's side there's efficiencies and effectiveness in the court system that we reap real benefits from and I'm talking about in the millions of dollars a year whenever they are adjudicating individuals and they have the proper misdemeanor probation system set up and you know, right now we're working with Patty and Johnny on trying to make sure the individuals are properly notified so they can show up the court so they don't get these um, frivolous failures to secure warrants because they can't tell time or can't keep a correct date. Seeking those efficiencies, you know, you've seen a very, very real decrease in the total jail population because once they're adjudicated, they move on. They may move or they may may reform, many don't, and we all know the, the recidivism rates. But if you'll go to the next, uh, let's see, this is a slide. Oh, well, that 927 warrant is <coughs> probably a 30 year old. I'm happy to form, it's been about a 30 year old. If you look at the jail status, and that's on page seven, you'll see that we have 300 available beds. As of today, 266 of them are, are filled. And that's enabled us to seek some of the revenues that we have that will help cover some of our future requirements. Now, a few years ago, we all understand what type of situation we were in, in with the jail. We understand what type of situation every single county that surrounds us are in right now with their jail. Because this county commission and previous county commissions did the hard, did the hard thing years ago we can reap some. We, we can reap some benefits. Uh, it's, it's a big deal whenever you, you hear efficiencies and effectiveness in the court system in the clerk's office. We feel the benefits, and it, that's allowed us to pursue, you know, uh, keeping an average of 40 federal detainees, you know, in our jail, you know, rather than filled with individuals over there that are there for failure to appear that, that may or may not need to be there. And that allows us to, you know, come to you and ask for, you know, two hundred twenty-one thousand dollars on each side to pay for the comp time and overtime. And there's still going to be an additional, we'll go over revenue here in a minute, an additional three hundred thousand dollars a year that's going to be realized that we can we can apply towards communications, we can apply towards a records management system, we can apply towards any other requirements that jail may have without having to come back to you and ask for those funds. So it's a big deal on the. Uh, on the efficiencies and effectiveness in the, in the court system. We've worked several systems. Arrest Watch is one. Patty's working with us on one called court, Fine Courts. Uh, you may have seen the Common Operational Picture Information Exchange or the Clean Up Your Neighborhood tool that we've got out there. There are some systems also that allow us, us those efficiencies and effectiveness. 
getting back to the, uh, I guess slide five, I'm kind of jump forward here. The drug task force results. Put that slide in there and really we'll look back at the crimes reported in the slide. You'll see a huge jump in 2016-2017 time frame and you'll see it go back down. At that point, we established a uh, an interagency an interagency task force with Elizabeth Police Department, the DEA, and the ATF. And on this drug task force results slide, you'll see a little gray box right here that says about 120. That's 120 federal indictments that were largely meted out based on the investigation that centered around that spike and it's mainly in thefts on our reported crime. What and this is important to note on our side, and it's important for you to note because everybody here felt back when all those thefts uh, you know, were happening, a lot of them happened down in the Happy Valley Central Area, and of course they happened in general all over the county. What we felt at that time was the cartels changed their, changed their strategy. Uh, the primary drug of choice in this county is methamphetamine. That's been well known and well established. You know, they liked pills for a while, they liked heroin for a little while, they killed them off, so they didn't like heroin anymore. And they, they went back to methamphetamine. Prior to 2015-2016, they produced methamphetamine with the one pot shake and bake wipes. That's how they produced it. And there wasn't a lot of money in it. They produced just enough for their consumption. But at that point, the cartels got together and decided that they were going to wage <coughs> what I consider asymmetric warfare against the United States. They dropped the, the price of their drugs by half. They quadrupled their production and they flooded us that year. So what you had during that year when you saw those crimes go up was an influx of extremely cheap methamphetamine to come into this county and the individuals that consume that basically lost their minds because they were getting it at a price that they could never get it before and they got it in a quantity and a quality that they never got before. So we saw a huge spike in, in auto burglaries and residential burglaries and every other kind of theft. You know, Walmart feels it, uh, Lowe's feels it, you know, when they walk out the door with everything down there. Um, by cooperating with the DEA and ATF and Elizabeth and Police Department, that 120 indictments basically disappeared. The 120 main individuals that were distributing the narcotic over the past year. The amounts, the seizures were, they were crazy. It was crazy. I mean, we were, we were seeing 20, 30, you know, a cumulative, I guess what he's got here, um, the, the amounts of kilos of methamphetamine that were seized, that's not what they wait to put on somebody during a charge, that were seized, that were taken off the streets here, was something that you would see out of a major city. But <clears throat> that interagency effect was, it was significant, and, and it continues, and that's why you see the numbers attrating down, and that's why we aggressively pursue the individuals that commit the petty crimes because they're the ones that are, that are out there stealing to, to consume this stuff. So we've, we've approached that from two different sides. See if I may, you, know, you, you hear a lot, and, and I take up the step, but my philosophy is that we do drug investigations that were very, 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 very good. 120 federal indictments speaks to that. And if you've not read anything about those indictments, nor will you. Because I make that choice. We don't put what we're doing in drug investigations in the media. And that's intentional. It makes us very successful at what we do. You've never seen 120 indictments in one thing go over one year in Carter County. Federal indictments. Those people have gone away for years. Some of them are like sentences. That's what they're facing. Uh, they're very good at what they do and it allows us to bring federal agencies in. Uh, and it's, it's been extremely successful and we'll continue that. I'm not going to put it in the paper. It gives me a little bit of pat on the back when I do it because it makes people think I'm doing things I'm not doing. But I choose not to do that. I can politicize it. But we are very successful drug operations in this county. And you will never be what we're doing. And it's, it, I've told you before, if somebody wants more individually, I'll show you some things that we're doing. We're, we're very successful. Next slide would be the school resource officer slide. What I'm trying to do there is kind of visualize what we talked about earlier. That's, that's the, uh, over the past year, finishing out, you know, providing SROs for every school, plus providing one 
roaming supervisor. Um, there are also two, two certified there, keeping it real, I think's the name of the program, instructors that exist within the uh, SRO program. out 
um, to DHS ST based really on an AAR where we participated in unfortunate and the unfortunate shooting over in Sullivan County. We were working on lessons learned. But it will change everything as far as our ability to effectively respond to a, a school security event. So whenever you see an extra little bit of money on the communication side, making sure that school resource officers have smartphones, that's part of the infrastructure on that. But it's mainly training and equipping that piece. So it's proper proper screening, keeping the doors locked, and uh, enabling an, an effective response, and, and making sure that we can effectively you know, direct traffic as far as rescue squads and fire departments and that kind of thing, whatever, if they ever had to arrive on, on scene. But we're working very hard on that, on the safer schools piece. I can pay Dr. Warren for working on this. Uh, I can remember working with him 20 years ago when we were at the first six SROs, and he was leading the state then, and he's leading, and you all are leading the state now. Talk about the jail, that's the next slide. Um, things that you provided over the past year, year and a half, um, we've got an x-ray over the jail. That may or may not mean much to you, but it, on the counter contraband, in deterring the individuals from packaging, you, I'm not going to be descriptive, the packaging, trying to bring in narcotics in places that they shouldn't be placing things, uh, we can detect it with the x-ray. That, that will save a life or save lives eventually. Now, that's a deterrent. We can't put a, a number on that. It will save us on the medical side. It will save us on the, on the liability side. And it will certainly save somebody's life. Currently, we're the only county in the state that has, a, has an x-ray. Uh, we were able to do that with some, some securest revenue that you allowed us to spend. Uh, we've got a trained dog that, that can sniff out cell phones and contraband as well. Over the past year, and what we're currently working on as far as efficiencies and effectiveness, Obviously, we had to take care of the drains. We're improving the cameras and DVRs. We are going to a video visitation system, which will help the, the elderly and the shut-ins from having to come down and visit their family member. They're locked up down here. They can do it um, virtually. A uh, very, very important thing that's in the, in the Secures contract that we'll bring to you probably next month is video arraignment. Uh, video arraignment is going to be very important to us uh, because if you've ever been in the courts and you've seen 12 or 13 of our jailbirds lined up on the side of the wall, that's a, that's a security risk for us. Transporting individuals from Sullivan County and Washington County, you know, back and forth for arraignment is a security risk for us and it's also inefficient. But the video arraignment, we believe, with the judge and the clerk being able to arraign them, do the initial arraignment of that inmate from their, from their desk side and we have the inmate in a room off to the side of their cell block is uh, an efficiency and effectiveness that we're seeking for the next year. That's basically, you can look through the jail status, you can kind of see what the breakdown is now. You can gauge the health of a jail by obviously its capacity and then its breakdown. If you see pre-trials, um, where we're at right now, pretrial misdemeanor and pretrial felony, those are healthy numbers. We've been as high as 160 and 180 between those two aggregate numbers in the past. Now we're down to about 120. So that means your court system is working fairly efficiently. And paying attention to the court system and understanding what it can do to the pocketbook in the county is a big deal. Uh, it put us in a crisis a few years ago. It really did. And I'm not going to. We're in much better shape. We're in much, much better shape than we have been, both on uh, collection of uh, fines and costs and just individuals. It, it's, it's managed much more efficiently. Chief, Chief Lockout, I would add that since we have involved CCI into the county in one month, we our office brought in $20,000 for the cost of fines. One month. Of one month. That has. That you will see that average. They are these people are coming in left and right, paying not fifty dollars, they're paying six, seven, eight hundred dollars at time because they are being told they got to pay. Um, so you're going to see the revenue in the next year average twenty thousand dollars a month. Just that was not being done by the previous probation that we had. So. 
that's just a, just a, a little bit of what we're seeing from that probation office. We read the numbers. I've been keeping a tally on it. One month, 20,000. That'll go back into the county coffers. Normally, uh, we would we expect or have hopes of picking up the federal contract since we are now both pretrial and federal inmates in our facility. But do we expect to see any ground availability? Because I know the standards to be able to maintain federal inmates. Yes, sir. I, I can tell you. We will have something to bring to the county commission during this next budget year regarding that. Uh, the chief deputy U.S. Marshal, name of Frank Castiglia, he and the U.S. Marshal, uh, Marshal Jolly, came up. They came to Carter County to request us to keep more federal detainees than, than what we're currently keeping. We keep an average between 40 and 44 now. And I've been a little bit leery about keeping more because of the transportation requirements. Uh, we did order a uh, transport van uh, back last August time frame, and it just recently came in. And it's really kind of helped us on the transport side because if you have 40, 45 inmates and they're required a green uh, we were, it was very inefficient. We were running a couple of Tahoes a day down there full of federal inmates. Until we brought the van on, we were not willing to agree to keep any more because it was manpower-wise, it was painful. Um, they have asked us to, to keep more, and a lot of that requirements based, I can tell you, since President Trump uh, came in office and he gave the, the, the three-letter agencies the green light to go back and enforce them, you know, certain federal statutes, and of course the ICE, ICE statutes, the amount of federal detainees in East Tennessee has increased by about 50%. So they need more bed space. So that, that's one of the main reasons they came to us. But we're the only jail that they came to because we're a fairly new jail. We have capacity. And you know we were reaching the transport capacity. So there is the potential to increase from 40 to roughly 60. We may come back to you and ask uh, sometime in the mid-year time frame for a, for a second van because they are also talking about, you know, renegotiation, renegotiation of the contract with the three-year mark. That's not set in stone, but as part of that renegotiation, they will say, they will say, if you've got extra space up there, will you consider finishing out that extra space? You know, adding it basically to our negotiation. It's basically, they will essentially pay to build additional beds in the jail to keep additional federal detainees. That's something that we're assessing. We haven't said yay, nay, or anything other than yes, we'll assess it. But first things first, um, we'll make sure that we're squared away with what we're doing because it is producing a good bit of revenue. We'll try to increase that by 50%. We may ask for an investment in the second van to make sure we have enough transportation assets to do that. And then the next thing we'll also ask you to do is invest in the you know, 2.5% or more cost of living allowance to make sure we keep a, a competent uh, jail staff because whenever you're constantly rotating individuals in and out, it's hard to get them trained and, and competent in their, in their business. But the, that kind of leads into the next slide, the cost of living slide. So yes, there are discussions and negotiations and it's all positive. Uh, we'll take it one step at a time. We'll try to go from 40 to 60 we do have the, the bed capacity to do so. And if it is the commission's will and assessment kind of make, says it makes sense, we may approach you sometime in, in the near future to say, you, know, you may want to consider allowing the U.S. Marshal Service to contract with us in a negotiation to build some additional beds over there. And that may be, that, in that statement, that includes enclosing or developing out the undeveloped area on the Correct. west end. Has, has it had a point that's even been discussed? I know last year on the middle of the ground, it one is, time they come in here on the ball, it's been discussed. It is being discussed, and that goes to prove the wisdom of the, the previous county commissions. I know it's very painful for them, but 
this county commission may be able to reap some benefits from that, you know, two to three to four years down the road. Uh, next slide is cost of living allowances. Uh, and what I tried to do is visualize what we talked about in the past, you know, past couple of years, the gap that we're seeing by not getting these cost of living allowances. And what you'll see is a history of the cost of living allowances from 2006 to, until the current. And what you'll note, the last large COLA that we got was in 2006. And I think that's right before I went back into the, the Army. Uh, we were getting COLAs just a little bit larger than the actual cost of living, so the employees were gaining a little bit at that time. The next year, we stayed even. And then after that, you know, the cost of living allowances essentially ceased. Uh, and the price of food, gas, and everything continued to increase. It also became exacerbated in the 2011-2012 time frame whenever the new employees were required to pay for their retirement and required to pay for their insurance. And they, the new employees essentially fell an 8% decrease. You know, I think that was all set probably by 2% COLA that was given during that time frame, so it was still basically 6% the wrong way. Uh, in 2015, I think we got a 3% bonus. 2016, we got a 3% cost of living. 2017, I think we got a 1%. And then last year, it's in around the quarter percent quarter percent line. But I, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Patty was talking about the, the amount of jailers that we were seeing come and go. Whenever they saw that, you know, six or eight percent decrease that one year, you know, Cap Smith was running the jail. I think he lost 60, 70 jailers that year. I mean, it was a big number. You know, whenever you only have 57 jailers, you can't afford to lose 60, so just you, you have a brand new jail every year, and it's just employees. It was it's God bless him, you know, for what you know, Tom was having to struggle through with just the endless hiring and the endless HR piece and endless training piece and try to run a jail on top of that. It's tough, tough business, but I can tell you, once we saw the three percent, it went down to 20. You know, we've been in the, in the 30 range since. Uh, but they do appreciate the loyalty that's returned. You know, they, they get the county loyalty and, they, and uh, they appreciate the loyalty when it's returned and they'll stick. So we hope that you keep the 2.5% cost of living allowance in our budget. Um, we hope that we may see a little bit more, you know, more than that, but we appreciate whatever we get. Um, that said, moving on to the future requirements slide. These are requirements that we do not expect to come to the county commission for new money. These are uh, requirements that we expect to cover with the additional federal and state surplus board bills and the uh, additional monies that we've got from the security contract, a securist contract. But we will have to go through a very significant communications life cycle upgrade. The, the comms really haven't been touched since the 80s or early 90s and the mount top repeaters and all the radios in the cars and that kind of thing because we reuse them are going to have to be upgraded and it's going to cost i had 400 800 thousand tom got a estimate in today of somewhere around 600,000 line, so kind of close um, life cycle replacement for our records management system is going to cost a little less than 400,000, but we do need some other systems that we've been talking to uh, Brad and Michael about to help us better manage our our payroll and better manage our fleet uh, fleet maintenance and better record, better manage the uh, accountability of the items that we the durable items that we brought. Uh, Comp and holiday pay continued, and in, in additional infrastructure. We kind of talked about that. That's the van. Uh, in general, uh, I can give you some forecasts on revenue as they're coming in. We talked about the, the main thing, which is the potential of increase in federal inmates, you know, from 40 to 60 over the next year or so, and you know, potentially whatever that brings in the future. We believe that the state's going to pay us. That's in the in the budget. I don't know if the 
we've got past $42 a day, minus $39 a day. That's about a 7% increase over what we were getting. And uh, we prefer not to keep state inmates because we know what the state, it costs the state $74 a day to keep an inmate. They turn around and pay us 39 bucks. They make money on us, so we prefer not to keep them. Although it's really hard to get them to take them off our hands. So we take whatever we can get, get for that. The Secures contract will increase from $53,000 to roughly $98,000 a year this year. We talked about the increase in, in uh, commissary monies. We talked about the potential increase on the Bend Engine contract. The Social Security Administration monies. And there's another one which talked about increased efficiencies in the court system. Uh, we've asked the district attorney and the judge in Johnny's office, and they are, they are they're helping us out with sour fashion issues. Now, what sour fashions are, it's requiring the bonding companies to go out and pick these individuals up that they're responsible for. If they don't, within six months, the county basically gets a conditional forfeiture of that bond, and that money comes back to us. That's monies that have not been collected in the past because bonding companies have not been required traditionally to uh, go pick these individuals up. We've been having to do it. I can tell you right now, there's basically a million dollars in outstanding bonds on individuals that the bonding companies are responsible for. We believe that there's, they're probably going to have about a 90% success rate. Uh, so there could be as much as $100,000 in conditional forfeitures that could be generated over this next year because I think the last few sire fashions are in the, in the process of being issued. It's about 120 to 140 sire fashions have been issued here over the past little bit. But, those monies will help supplant uh, the monies that we have to spend to go pick up individuals out of state, whether it be in Texas or Louisiana or wherever. Uh, and that's been a burden on the county, and now it's going to be a burden. Burden on the contractor will be a burden on the, the bonding companies to pick those costs up in the future. But we're looking forward to that. Um, that's kind of how we go through the planning programming, budgeting, and execution piece, and why it's important, and what you're getting for your money, and what you can expect to get in the future. Um, we'll continue to, to get after them. The International Crimes Against Children Task Force will come on board this year. We just recently picked up 14. How many was it, Abby? Seven. 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 Seven individuals on 14 charges on just a sex offender compliance check. But we're going to get the predators out of the community like we're getting the wanted persons out of the community. But uh, Isaiah will lead that up on our side on the forensic collection piece. We also have a, an investigator, Jenna Markle, that will be heading up that piece on the investigative side. But that's the, what you get for what you're spending at $8.6 million. I know it's been long winded, but I think it's very important to understand what you're getting. And it's very important for you to be able to ask questions. If you have higher expectations, you know, we'll get after it. We'll manage and train and equip whatever it takes to get after whatever it is that, that we need to on the uh, on the criminal side. Any uh, questions? Any other questions? Yeah, I remember, remember this too. If we better request, better train our officers and other agencies to find out what our county sheriff's office is doing. We've got coming from across the state. But, and as we better train and get better officers, we've got to remember other people who want these better officers to be better. I want to, I bet our key guys are now a tremendous pay to stay here. So we've got to you know, just keep that in mind. The better officer we have, the more desire he is by the Raiders. You better trade it good. I try, I do. I'm going to try. I'm going to take this. I'm about to take the chance I got to take Paul Thompson's like yesterday, last week. Typically, we ought to have Smith come up and address us for something. I mean, I know he's about ready to blow up. Like, he, he got something over there. We only keep Captain. We only keep Captain Smith for the bad things. He's got like that break, 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 and you know, break glass in case of emergency. That's what we keep. Negotiator. Tom Jefferson got negotiator. He wins. He wins. He wins. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. Michael Smiley because Michael knows that he's normally the run most of Most of the time, it's That's fair. I feel a couple phone calls too. So, okay. <laughs> uh, any, anything for Chief or Sheriff? Anybody? 
Thank you all. Yes. And again, I do know you have a hard job. I do not understand. Well, we have a hard job. You guys are very hard. You have, very very, you have a great sheriff's office up there. I'm yeah. telling you. Well, we, we appreciate what you do for us every day, keeping our school safe, keeping our community safe. You know, we expect a lot of it. Uh, we get that from you. And I know it takes money to, to fund you guys and keep you going. So we appreciate it. Money drives operations. All right. Michael's stating that we need to go over the drug fund. Just the drug control fund. Yeah. There's essentially no change on that one. Let us follow that real quick. Let us follow that. It should be the uh, its own separate. Yeah. 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 Somebody got that. Basically, that level is based on notional revenue that, that we expect to come in from fines and forfeitures you know, throughout the year. And we anticipate that it will bring in that amount. And if it does bring in that amount, that's what we will spend and that's how we spend it all. Uh, because there's several, we'll say several hundred pending cases out there right now, we should see some fines and forfeitures, maybe some larger ones on the federal side. But uh, that's what we anticipate for the next year. All right. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Adam Schroeder, Mr. Sauter, Ms. Miller, and Mr. Rick Miller, we have a joint effort. So in that, now we are, um, Ms. Delauder, she wanted a free room for cats that was never completed. And so we have talked with our board, and our board has promised her that we'll do everything we can for a free room 
for cats to run. So that again is going to create more space for animals in those rooms. Again, we never ever increase for our uh, sewer or water. And on our sewer and water, you'll notice the increase here. That increase is because Johan from the city came to me one day and said that their auditors at the city had found that we were listed as residential there and we are actually commercial. So that actually doubled and now is up to about the last one was around $500 that we paid per month. So we increased in electricity. Our propane went up and we had to transfer $9,000 for propane to get us through the end of the year due to our existing agencies. Now we have um, asked for the reserve to be brought over to fix the HVAC system. That is getting fixed. I did not reduce the amount of propane on this budget because I do not know how much propane that is going to cost us in the year to come. Um, we did not ask for any part-time help until this year and we brought it before the commission and the commission gave us two part-time. In this budget, we have asked for one of the part-time to become full-time personnel, which will leave us with two part-time. And that is with their 2.5 increase in the budget um, that is listed also. Um, we have, um, you'll see a 11,956,000 dollars increase in the medical line. That is from Freddie was paid from the city of Elizabeth and when he was still employed at the shelter. And when we transferred over Freddie's, we transferred the 30,000 that he was making. We did not include his medical expenses in the line items because that was paid from the city. So that didn't, we just missed that part and assumed that it was in the line items. Um, the two part-time personnel that was granted and approved by the commission is about 28,000 increase in this budget as well. In the previous budget where there is a $600,000 budget, um, we have reached out to many of our um, veterinarians, our colleges, our resources, and we have got that amount down substantially, but we intend on cutting that amount down even more in the coming years. Now, is your part time personnel a part that's identified in 164 as attendance? Is, the, that, is the, that where that amount comes from? The one part time that we're moving to full time. Is that what you're asking? No, what I'm saying is. In your statement, you have 36,000 <coughs> two part time. Well, I don't find the two part time in here unless it's under the caption of line 164 attendance. 169. 169. 169. Right. 169. Correct. So basically, we would add from 169. Yeah, to 162. Just pushing it up there. Correct. Now, there's a lot of bad calls that. They have, I'm going to say, they have to stop the inmate uh, people from coming in because of problems with their cause of burnout sales in the other departments. Correct. We was um, getting three to four trustees per day. Now we're getting anywhere from zero to two. We're usually not getting any more than two on a lot of days. Usually one day a week we're down to one. Um, and we're there seven days a week. It's not like that we run five days and we go home. Regardless of holidays, regardless if it's snow, rain, sleets, it doesn't matter. We're there seven days a week. And the earliest we get out on Sundays is around three o'clock. And that's where the guys coming in at seven. So with the staff that we have and the numbers that we have, it's really, really hard to get a schedule to get everybody in there. The less staff that we have in there, the longer they have to stay. The board, the board has told her that she can close on extra day since we don't have enough help. And she has done that. But at the same time, they have to go in that night and clean and take care of everything. And a certain so, part of it happens every day. Exactly. You, don't, you don't have any time around. So next week, somebody has to be there. The feeding and cleaning is going to happen. Correct. 
us how many you have on there. Well, they're building a comp time too because there's nobody to want to get sick or whatever. Right. We don't have relief. Right. We don't have it. Uh, that's one reason why the board decided to close <clears throat> after a certain amount, you can't get it. Correct. It's cut, the compound's cut off, so it's not really fair to them. And when one's out, that just means that we're there a couple hours longer. Okay. The, uh, has the funds dried up now for the uh, water? The water? Yes. Water. yes. yes. Well, is yes. that dried up? That's all being used. Yes. You know, uh, in your statement, I want to go, you know, we got run free room for water gunner. Has anybody looked at the limit on what your capacity is? We do have a limit, uh, and we spoke about a limit with our board members, and we agreed upon a limit. Here's what happens in Carter County. When you shut intake, you find them outside your gate or through your gate roaming around. There's litters of kittens out there. There's pit bulls charging you when you go through the gate. They will slide them right on through the gate. The hill on the charge one time, you won't have a problem. You can't get the time number to charge. No, you don't understand what I'm saying. Is there any chance? What I'm saying is that if they don't put a true live limit and stick to that limit, your budget is not going to be in control. We have cut down on the, okay, last November, we had 180 to 190 cats in that building. How many years was that? And the reason being is people will come in and they'll rock them at the door and they'll leave. I'm not taking those cats back with me and they, they're leaving litters. This stuff gets cussed during kitten season on a routine basis and we're paying them $10 an hour. Is there any chance you're going to bring our euthanasia to control this population? Other than sick or aggressive animals? May I? The one who lost you. It never had been abolished. It was in the rules when both sides came together. Why is it not exercised? The euthanasia? Yeah. The euthanasia was at the shelter. And the uh, DEA contacted me, and there was a huge issue with the permit and the license that was there and how it was obtained. So, therefore, that was um, either relinquished or it was going to be, um, he spoke of charges being placed. So that was before my time. I had nothing to do with that. You're talking about when they removed the it control was, substance during that the was rain the automatic? Is that what it is? Yes. <laughs> that was, it was obtained illegally. And when we call the state, that facility has never been inspected for that drug. They never had a permit for that drug per the building. So that is something, and we have to be in agreement with our veterinarian because it goes under her license. So that is something that we spoke with our board about. Um, and euthanasia is costing us out here anywhere from $15 to $55, just depending. If you take in a feral cat, they're going to charge you $55 because they're not going to risk their staff getting bitten or rabies. They're going to uh, give it a sedative before they even touch the cat. So, you know, you're running into some more liabilities whenever you do bring euthanasia on board. But it is something that we talked to our board about. We feel strong and confident that we have a staff that uh, can maintain the drug. We can get a, a permit for the facility. And when that comes, we will have a certified euthanasia tech. Right. Certified euthanasia tech, correct. Correct. Yes. I'm sorry about for that. That's it. <laughs> so weird question. I was there one day, and you guys just shut the doors. Like, what, what happened? Because I was there just going around looking for an animal myself, and somebody was dropping off a dog, and you guys at that point stopped collecting animals. And that's the second time, according to the staff, that that dog had been taken to that day. Yes. So I guess the people do they just drop the dog back off outside the fence and just drive off? Or? Yes, they will. Yeah. They oh. go in the morning, or they're outside the gate. Sometimes chained up to the gate. They've been chained to the gate on outside and inside. Which I mean, I guess I understand both sides. If I'm doing the due diligence and picking up a dog off the street, what do I do with it if I can't take it home? Call 911. 
Ms. Pizzano wants the status of the bill to structure your We almost have our HVAC system complete. Uh, we're very happy with that. The smell is a, a tremendous uh, amount better than what it was the last time he was our model. Um, we, uh, Mr. Schubert has a list of things that are currently problematic and he has spoken with um, several people from the beginning of the first building um, to the contractor of the second building and the contractor of the third building. So he came over today and uh, there's a roofing issue and he brought a piece of roofing down off the roof with him and gently handed it to us. So when it rains this week, he told us to go ahead and expect some leaks. So um, it is problematic from A to Z. Um, there are several issues there and I could go on and on and on about the issues there. Um, he's doing the best he can to get it fixed as quickly as he can, but it is baby steps and step by step. Did you say that he has had a point just looking percentage-wise of what you use says that what it's supposed to be effective with and helping you all do your job. That it would be worthy of this county to look at a contract, even blow it up or bring it in. Put them under the umbrella and do this thing right. Because if it doesn't, what it looks like to me, when I hear the building ground, it's dollar and that's the data. When the HVAC caught on fire, it had been for the animals, that would have been the best thing to happen. But you don't want the animals to be in there. If you want to build us a new shelter, we'd be glad to have it. <laughs> build us a new shelter, we'll be glad to have it. <laughs> I'll be glad to move every animal over there. And we will be taking the cost of all this to, to the city because they are responsible. Well, I know what you think about contractors' percentages for they, they have to pay too, and I know they're diligent about that. In my opinion, it just seems like at the look at that bottom line, it was at when prior to you starting, I think it was what was it, 120,000? I'm just going to pop in and it's dangerous. This has been worked over by chemicals for the last six months. 179. Left eye goes up somewhere. Well, I, I think it's either 120 or 180,000, I think is what, what the budget was total on the thing. And, and then it keeps creeping up, creeping up, and that's why I question the numbers. It's got to stop them. It's got to be. But you have to remember that we're adding buildings, which means it's adding. <laughs> I know. You don't need a building. You're adding the walls and walls, and I don't think we're going to have to follow them. Right. And trustees are on the board. Right. I mean, that, that's always been the general the general conception. Is we'll, well, we'll just throw trustees at it. We use them as a board. Shannon, who's that the control of the animal control truck I see going around town? Is that under your direction or is that the sheriff's department? No, sir, it's the sheriff's department. Could I have received some call for calls from Dennis Colbert? Some gentleman's dog got attacked, he went to the dog in the front yard, and then another gentleman was eaten by another dog, and the animal control was not picking any animals up. Anytime you have an animal control or an animal issue, if you call the shelter and say, I have a dog in my yard, just attack my dog, you need to call 911. And at that point, 911, um, they dispatch a road off route, and he deems it necessary for animal control, they'll call animal control. Um, some of them are petty, and it's a neighborly dispute, and he leaves it be between the two neighbors. Um, but if it's something serious, he does call our animal control. In your, in your budget, we're operating on right now. This is your proposed coming up. Physically, you fire at your facility during the day on the average? Um, so, we have currently four full time employees and we have three part time um, plus okay. myself. Uh, this budget that you're requesting is for what will your numbers be there? We will have five full time and two part time part -time. plus myself. So, you're paying one out part time? One part time, part -time to a full time. Okay. Yeah, one part time to a full time. We I'd like to say that the sheriff taking on more federal maintenance, that means there's less regular inmates that can come. And if there's a lockdown or whatever, then you know, that shuts that off. And the 
sheriff's right, we should not depend on them for employees because they're not you know, employees. But we have in the past for years and years, and that helped the budget for the animal shelter. Yes. Well, now we can't because they're not sending them for you know, a couple reasons, legitimate reasons, I'm not saying they're not. But therefore, you left empty handed also. Same thing happened in the landfill. Exactly. But it's, it's a, some of the rules, some of the laws, and everything else, the liability that you can't even pick the sheriff to use an inmate. Sure. Okay. Once, yeah. it's easy to get an inmate to come to work, but you are responsible for the conduct, the travel, the work, keeping your eyes on them, putting, and we don't have that set up. And what that has allowed in the past is infiltration of controlled substance in our jails, uh, rendezvous and parking lots and behind pine trees and different facilities. I mean, you know, and uh, the sheriff's coming to the fire for it. And I, I really don't blame but once you get used to that, as you say, that free labor, oh, it's hard to get that, get that out of your mouth. You just like it, it's nice. Yes, yeah, it's a free you know. took classes, you know, take the inmates out. Like I said, if one joke is doing great, what you're doing, I just divide them all. And I remember just that one year we saved the county for more than $700,000. I mean, that was a big impact, you know. But like I said, we can't. Shane, you mentioned earlier that your program cost me enough. Correct. Okay, well, there's nothing on the program in my life, so it's all in natural gas. So I don't get really switched. We had um, considered going to natural gas because it's cheaper. After we got into some of the units and our propane water heater, which is hard plumbed in there, and it's, we're going to a commercial dryer um, that will be propane. You can't have two gases in one building. So, and then we run into a problem with the gas line the natural gas line coming into the building. So it would really probably benefit us just to stay where we are, and that's what Chris Schubler and the Nate program. Yes. Okay, it's, it's always in the natural gas. Now, in that number, I do expect that number not to be 15,000, um, just because the systems are working together now, and they're not working against each other, and the air that you're put, the heat you're putting in here is not going to be stuck there in the next vent right beside of it. And that's what was happening before. Now, on your other contract, you may cover this, I may just miss it. You had a decrease of 11,000 and other contract services and 44,500 drugs and medical supplies. Is that going back under the veterinary service line that offset each other? We did switch uh, around. And we did create some new line items that will help us know exactly where things are supposed to be going and they are going. We don't know exactly what the city's getting here yet, do we have that not? That's not going to occur here yet. Well, the contract right now is 25%, but as you know, during some of the board meetings, we've been talking to them about increasing that. Hopefully, it's maybe 30, 35. Now, my understanding is, since I work for the city, I see this third top is 100,000, period. Well, it's all a percentage is what the contract says, 25%. Okay. Contract probably was different than what the contract Yeah, I think that happened a little too with yeah. the contract or something. But we're, you know, we're, we're hoping that maybe they could request more funds or have a more kind of budget too. But that's a, that's a reimbursement, right? That's like reimbursement at the end of the year. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
relationships between different uh, facilities that have been destroyed that we are still recreating. Uh, we do have a relationship with two good ones now that is substantially cheaper. At one point in time, we were spending anywhere from 102 for a cat spay to 175 for a dog female spay. And that is just burning us up. So we have researched, we have um, negotiated, we have begged, pleaded, and borrowed from different sources. And we have two great sources. We have to travel a little bit, but it's worth the travel for us to do so. And it will cut that cost substantially. So you're speaking about veterinary service, exportable, Surgeries. Surgeries. I know, yeah, it was going to LMU. And, 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 and so those relationships that you referred to in a relationship such as that, that was. LMU is one of them. Uh, we are at Asheville for another one. But when you take 20 animals at a time in that land, you're saving substantially money every time that you take a trip. So are we. We spay and neuter these before we're even adopted. Um, Is that something that's going to cost to wait until they actually adopt them and then send them to a vet? If they are yeah. under six months of age, you get a spay or neuter contract. If they are over six months of age, we do everything we can to make sure they're spayed or neutered outside of here. Um, we had the feral cat seminar here. Since then, we have um, people who have donated money to friends of the shelter. And we have educated people on those feral cats. And honestly, the people that we've educated, they are willing to try to take them. They take them. Yeah, I was surprised about what they were spending out of their Yes. Obviously, it's But you know, people are, they are, are willing to listen if you will take the time to educate them on how to get that animal fixed, even if it is feral. And so far, we've had good success, and those people are keeping their cats, are taking their cats to one location to have it spayed and neutered. So I feel like that feral cat program is, is really going to be a success. It, it takes some, some education, but I think that people are willing to do it. If you're saving money on that, people bring them in and tie them to the gate and leave them in the boxes you should have taken them in and you should have <coughs> take care of those animals and send them. We do. We do. The, you have a camera system on that building? We do, but the problem is, is people pull forward, they don't back up, so getting their tag number, unless you have it way out at the mailbox, I've called the camera people in to see if we could even get a wireless camera in there where we could get tag numbers and pieces that I don't see a good system for you. I want to pull out, I want to point out, when you take these animals, Um, to be real honest with you, we have um, trained, okay, so when it was with previous administration, if you're talking about the dog that we lost before, because... No, I'm just saying, oh, while they're gone, that means you're short. Correct. At the shelter. It's so four hours. Or part -time. It's at least four hours every time you go to LMU. Um, it's about three and a half when you go to Asheville. Uh, we're saving money on medical, but it's been a strain on those employees. Okay. We have reworked our schedule to either Mondays or Fridays for pickup. Um, if you get to Asheville, you pick up the following day. If you get to LMU, you drop off on a Monday and you pick up on a Friday. It is substantial savings. We do have a medical care manager at the shelter. She worked for a vet for 14 years. Instead of taking every little thing that is has an abscess or every little thing that has a cut or an ear that's bleeding and people think that it's bleeding to death. She's used to this and she has saved this county tons and tons of money on that deal. <coughs> Anything else? Okay. Um, Anything else? Okay. Um, Any more questions? Anything else? Well, Shannon, we appreciate you. Thank you. I'll be bored working hard. I've tried to run a shift and got off course there for a while. So. You both did good work.
is Carl Brown and Wolf. Um, they are really good to come in and they have space and take whatever. Um, some of the local shelters have actually called us wanting puppies this year because it's a, the puppy season has been short or coming in later this, this time. And so you'll have different shelters staying because they reserve in age groups. And so when people come in and there's nothing in this age group, they're like, oh, well, we've got room to take more animals in. But they want that allotment for, say, three months and under. So, and if we can help them out with cats, dogs, we gladly send them that way as long as we know who they are and where they're going and they are ready. We do not turn our animals out to just anybody that says, I am a rescue. Uh, we'll fly out of state. You know, they're in different states. They do have a couple um, a couple facilities in different states. Every time that they have came up on our animals, they have came in a car or van and picked them up. We've not flown animals anywhere. And when we do that, we have to have a uh, doctor actually fills out a form for them to try to buy the
Pack the lake up with you. Pray the budget be in this year, correct? Right. Unless you can correct the balance. We still look around for that. Or most people don't have this. Is that got a few to do? I'm not sure about the Yeah, it's. You can uh, do that. Uh, it's not it may, maybe next time we start going over all these, if, if we can't put it on the big screen, it's possible. Yeah. Shout out for everybody. Please. Yes, you want to just to keep in mind, we moved on the floor and you're going to have the workshop session uh, the week prior to coming on the main floor for the main June meeting. So we've got to keep in mind when we're working on the budget thing that we have it all laid out for our commission. It won't be no fun. You wait in, you got one finger in your mouth and one somewhere else waiting for the whistle to blow. You guys get it ready? Yes, Mr. Grimes, I have a quick question. Uh, this was brought to me, or brought up to me, was during the last year of Full County Commission, we talked about having that, that workshop. Um, it was mentioned during the conversation of having that workshop that that was going to be a paid workshop. It is. It's going to be paid at minimum state. Quite a it was also brought up to me that in order for that to be done, when I talked to the clerk's office, is that we would actually have to have a motion to actually have that done. It was a motion. It was in the motion to be paid at a bill for this gentleman here to make the motion. Now, how it was perceived by our clerks, we will verify that. So it was, but it, it, it was recorded with the, it was recorded as a paid workshop, however, the rate of pay was not I can take it. That's why I was on. I didn't hear right to it. So, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it should be in the recording as well. No, like I said, it, it was recorded by the clerk as it being a paid work job. It just wasn't out of which the rate of pay was. So, just to clarify. Right. 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 Remember, Brad said you're going to be a paid, so make sure you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could. And, uh, you know, let the man up, up take your hat. If you don't show, you raise the roof on the floor. And you meet, you may. You might be new or spade in your sale. You got a kind of cheaper service though. <laughs> you don't you have to worry about the board. It's not cheap, Brad. Right? <laughs> 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 yeah, we not have a job, we have a special meeting, so we need to begin. So we really should have started this meeting over again. Yeah, I mean, this would be a new hearing. Right. Yeah. So Oh, okay, yes, yeah, sure. Because so, so, we had to adjourn it for the next. Sorry, she got a sheet of paper there, but So this is still a hearing, though, right? Yeah. Right. Oh. I got it. But we adjourn. We adjourn the Okay, now we have the stuff we need to buy. Great. Forward up here. Whoever has that forward, whoever has that forward, as you can see, well, this is what the budget we proposed, uh, the preliminary budget for 1920, compared that with what's estimated for 1819. And any uh, significant differences are explained out in the change, inside the change percentage. And as you can see, some of them are large, such as county buildings. We had several projects in 1819, the EOC, uh, the Health Department, and the, the, the uh, Courthouse Security projects. And the property assessor, we moved the reappraisal budget up into the property assessor's budget this year at his request. The sheriff, as you can see, there's a two hundred seventy-eight thousand dollars decrease. But there were some building improvements, as Chief Parrish talked about earlier, and some uh, law enforcement equipment, radio equipment, whatnot, and uh, vehicles. And we 
also came into play with an additional Title III funds were allocated this year. 72,000 for Rescue Squad. And of course, also had a, a $210,000 variance in the animal shelter due to the $229,000 donation for the uh, dog runs. And 911 did request an increase of $79,714 this year. County Parks and Rec requested uh, 121,000 this year, which is an increase from 25,000 to 18,19,000. Now there is a home grant that's already been approved that the work will start in the next fiscal year. That is uh, count 58,130. As it stands now, uh, transfer to the solid waste fund from the general fund will decrease by 65000 through the increased revenues at the landfill. Does anybody have any questions about any of those? Uh, 
and then we adopt each one of those individual services. There's still a lot of questions to answer, but that's one of our main needs right now. Right, Ms. Holder, that's it. That would be, are you looking at that as inclusive with your with your culture? Or you no, no, it has nothing to do with culture. This is this is what. I said that's what yeah. the stigma in the air of often the county commissioners is is you know well we're going to give you a two percent. Everybody says it's cost me. Well, what about the wages? Oh, they're more wages. Yeah. They're totally different. Uh, I, I myself I think you. <coughs> Raise increases wages either every year, or every annual year, or maybe in 15 months. Uh, Which, kind of well, there are oftentimes you will see in, in the charts that I have seen come from EDS, you can say uh, a couple of come from our own government and with the federal government, he is that. Uh, Everybody will get a raise up here. Or you come in every year, you won't get two cents this year, two cents next year, two cents next year. You start adding money. You're going to find out that, that you, you're, you're paying more by that way than if you just put it in in increments and your employee knows it. They know what's coming from it. You know as a budget committee when you walk in day one exactly what the pay raises is going to be for that district. And it's not the total amount for the total county. Person. Now, they may be some disadvantages. You know, we haven't accumulated all the evidence, but. I've just got a question. If we implement something like that, once again, it's still up to the individual office holder to disperse that and make that decision. I mean, if we can't tell the office holder if this person gets this amount of money for being here this amount of years, how's that enforced? I mean, I, I well, know it's... That, that may be something uh, that, Ms. Woodbury, you know, we had not crossed that bridge yeah. yet. Uh, there's things I don't know about, so I said, well, does that affect what we start our yeah. employee out as when we come in? I have no, we have nothing to do with hiring the fire. It's out of our authority. I'm sure, from the question line that you gave, I'm sure that there is an operation rule or something there to, that can clarify that. I, we don't have that yet. We're not that far. But we're going to try to get it done within the next three to four months or we'll be able to sit through it, get the problems out of it to where it may be set for your next budget year. Uh, we'll get there by the time we're going to get back on that. Uh, if you've got any ideas, we'll fire them to us. I know ETSU, they, uh, they offer a great project. Yes, I'm going to post it. They offer $100 a year for every year you've been there. For, I don't know why, because she gets $100 every yeah. year. Right. So I guess her two years, she should have $1,000 in October for her. Yeah, that's correct. It's up to a maximum amount of you actually taxed. Which, speaking of raises, Brad did provide you guys some that big pamphlet with the uh, high government. The very last page does tell raises. These, these numbers come from calculating what the actual salaries are for 1819 estimated salary. Uh, we went back through and was trying to do a calculation as far as how much raises were in the budget already. But there's so many different uh, methods that have been used to make it impossible. Some of the raises are on what's budgeted the last year. Some of the, budget, some of the raises are based on what the estimated actual expense. And some of the raises are just, I'm not sure what they came from. <laughs> 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 they were wrong. Zero was zero. Zero was zero. I didn't have read it. I'm not sure if you're reading it. Should you not have said what raises will be in the uniform throughout the county? Well, I thought that's one point. Ms. Culler, there's only thing Ms. Culler mentioned two and a half percent. In her original motion, it was two and a half percent. That was the budget. At least two and a half percent. And you had some of them following along with that. Others had kind of got off and kind of put their own in. So if they come in other than that two and a half percent, send them out the door and say, you get it right. Here's what the rule is. I mean, the way it's a nightmare because you can't keep up with it. Yeah. 
But I think that's a lot of what you what you get with office holders is, you know, if I'm going to ask for a raise, yeah, right. right. Yeah. Now I also agree with you, right? That you know, we ask for two and a half percent, but do they tend to forget it's mightier than the sword? No, absolutely. No. The bad machine where the money comes from, you can get bullish all you want. Well, I think that that can kind of help around in their offices when they say, hey, they said two and a half, but hey, we'll go back for you and say, well, we want 4% for us. Well, if you go to the intervention, you need the intervention, but for the county, that's what you're for. We're going to provide that right. You've got to have some guidelines and say, what you could put in here for you. Two and a half percent. Yeah, but we never came. I don't think before the budget time when we talked to these these uh, offices and said, "Hey, we're looking at two and a half percent. Don't budget anything more or less than that." Did you? I mean, we we never got said that you know clear to any offices. I don't think so. But in a general business perspective, the way this normal the way it's handled before I work out is, is every year you get an X amount, and then it's based on performance on who gets. Mm -hmm more than that but by getting more than that you have the lower end performers that are getting less so you kind of bounce it out to where it is a flat three and a half percent and they can say okay you've been here and, and i guess in the case of the county employees i don't know what the what performance management or anything that they've got they can base it off of seniority or whatever to say you know the top end is going to get four percent and the low end is going to get you know one or two percent or whatever from the, the sheriff's office standpoint, I'm sure that they was the one that's from in the final standpoint for the budget committee to understand. From the sheriff's office standpoint, the, the scale that they use is, you know, higher out of one, zero to six months. Six months you're there, you get a retainer. You get basically a retainer, that's what it is, but it's a raise. So, you know, from six months to a year, at the year mark, you get another one. You know, and that's to keep people that, you know. And then, you know, you go from that one year, you go one to three, three to five, Five to seven, seven to eleven, wherever. And goes up to nine years. Yeah. And then you, you know, that's your captain. So you're put in each, you know, you're either you're a deputy or a jailer or you're a patrol or, you know, a sergeant or whatever. You're put in your different steps. And then if you know, you know, at the one year mark, this is why I'm going to make it. At the three year mark, you know, this is where I'm going to step up to. Uh, and then on top of that, from a cost of living standpoint, County comes into the cost of living increase. Okay, that affects everybody the same. You do a two and a half percent cost of living increase, then you you raise your steps up. You're two and a half percent, so that everybody scales based on what their scale is, and that's in relation to your the time you spend. You know, being and in fact being loyal to the county and, and working. And then of course, as your job duties differentiate, you know, you've always got you've always got those additional steps that you end up jumping into because your your job time changes. So, you know, I would, I would imagine that if you sit down with most office holders, and most office holders would say, I would love to do something like this. It's just, you know, when I'm having to come to the county commission and say, you know, I just want a two and a half percent increase, and I have to find, 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 then why would I take the time to work out a step raise plan when I know that that's going to be? Do you so, think we work on the individual in it had each department to, to do theirs. I think that that would be very, I think most office holders would be fairly acceptable. Uh, would be generally acceptable. We currently have always done our office that way. Uh, we have our coffee and employees who leave at 36 or 37,000. That salary is exhausted. We hire our lower ends higher to bring the discrepancy down. So therefore, we hire a lower amount. Six months we give a raise, a year we give a raise. Because that coffee and employee would read that's at 35,000. Therefore, that two newer salaries at the bottom to be able to take care of those bottom half employees you're therefore closing that gap between those 35,000 and bringing in those 22,000 with them. So our office is pretty much a tight-knit salary group just because we have budgeted and, and rearranged and worked those numbers and when, when Johnny first took office we did step raises for several years um, and capped out a, a 10 year employee at $1,000. It was $100 a year. Um, but then we, you know, we started having employees stay, and we finally lost our higher end employees. We have two more retiring this year at a thirty-five thousand dollars salary, which will clear that up, and we'll swing them back down, and which will pack them back together. That's currently how we do our budget, which it really should be the office holders should be doing that with their budgets. When your top end employees leave, you should hire your lower end employees and maybe give some of your others more.
reward to bring them in closer to where you're also rewarding, but yet not starting someone in at $18,000 a year, maybe $22,000 a year. But also you don't have that full part of raise every year based on the county commission. It's that. It's, it's money within the budget that uh -huh. should be managed and, and, and can be doing we, a full circle around. Uh, you're, you're already accounting for that yeah. step when you present the budget. And, that, and that's how the sheriff's office is. That's how, that's you, how we do You're it. already accounting for, you know, that, that captain that's been there for whatever amount of years yeah. to take that next step if there is. Well, see, the next is all this. We can't get that work out. Of course, I, I, you know, of course, the school board, they uh, invested in uh, in a firm that came in, I think, for the prior professionals to do a classification evaluation and send it for them. Um, I had heard of the about the board just how effective that is. But the next thing would be a classification of all our employees. But the thing is, too, it also is a comparison of what well, counties of like size and populous and, and everything is compared to which tells the story as to how far in the rear or how far ahead we are and where it is where good management can adjust that and bring us up to speed on a lot of them. They had to fill up surveys too, each one on yeah. what, what all they did. I think that the state, the, the city, I think the school board of pay is either 25 or 27 thousand. And, and of course, I know there's some having pros and cons about getting an outside contract now. So uh, until they do uh, an exact survey and classification of everybody's job in this county, we'll never get our people up, up to speed for the pay. And then, Ms. Scott? We did a study, like you were speaking of, about three, two or three years ago. We had each department and to go out and call Greenville, Unicoi County, Johnson County, and find out what every one of the departments made compared to what we did. And that's what we're going to use to try to start the step raises. But then it got very cumbersome to try to, to spread it out. But we did do that. We had them call around the different areas that were populous like us. So they, they may still have the information. I don't know. Well, but we, had, we did have one commission that kept program. saying, well, what if we find out that our people are making more money? I said, they ain't going to happen. I think that is just for our commissioners to determine whether it's going to be steps every 15 months, every two years, or, uh, and then come up with a percentage in between each one of those steps to get uniform. And then, you know, it'll, it should be done on the floor. But it needs to have some numbers to go along with too, to show what every year that you're a, a close estimate of what your cost is going to be for your increases for a budget year versus the way we've been doing it, which is unbelievable. Yes. So that's any of that's our picture. That's what that's what we're working for. That's our goal. Good. You got your feet. Well, you could pull a salary deep. Well, evidently, everybody in West County is considered a salary. I mean, you know, some of them are frozen at 43000 some of them are frozen at fifty, and some of them are frozen at $16,000 or $20,000 a year. So, how are you going to get rid of it? No. So, how are you going to pull this gap in? If you, know, if you, well, if you keep spreading out yeah. with the salary for the people that's already at the, you know, say, $60,000. But they get to me, I was going to work out. If they get 60, that's wrong. They ain't going to see them That's wrong. Well, that's wrong. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. You got to pull this in somewhere. Well, I've got well, 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 you down here pulling the plow. All you do is walk about it. Yeah. 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 So. There should be a gap there for reason. And I don't see a gap there for reason. And I don't see, since I work here, I don't think the county's been giving higher pay increases to higher salary and less to lower salary. No, it's been. A percentage across the board. So if let's say I make more money than someone else in the uh, crowd here, and I make forty thousand, I get three percent. It's going to be a dollar more uh, larger than your eleven dollar an hour employee, but as a percentage basis, we're making the exact same amount of money. And there's a reason why there's a separation. Usually, education, years of experience, uh, job duties, those should be the, the things that cause that split. I don't think you ever 
are going to be able to take the $11 an hour employee and get them close to the $47,000, $50,000 employee because there's, there's duties there that separate those positions. And, and what we do is like the cost of living rate, we get 1% to the higher people, 5% to the lower people, which will not make it solid gap. Yeah. And, and that was considered before, you know, I think Brady had that was his idea one time. So if you were below 25, you got 5%. If you were above, you got 3%. So what's the point in doing that, though? Because that's just punishing your hiring employees and saying that they don't do as much work as your lowering employees. So I need to give them a little bit of a That's really a Yeah, that's really a really cheap reason to say it's 60000 I only get one percent because, and then they get five. I learned, well, that's 60000 sitting on this back rear end. So you, so you think the six, okay, so all $60,000 employees are sitting on the rear end, just doing nothing? Yeah, I'll say that. Okay, that's what I need to hear. I've been over 30 years in this year. <laughs> they've had, they've had more yeah, in the past five years than I had in the whole 20 years. Yeah. And I have a supervisor that made $46,000 a year. That's an unheard of. That, I mean, in all my days in this county, that's totally unheard of. That supervisor might have made five hundred dollars more than the dollar spent. So, see, you're that, that's where you if you can get you know like how it works out with your office or how it works. I mean that's what your cost of living increases for is you know as your cost of living goes up because your cost of living means that you know everything is getting more expensive. The county sees it as a whole, the employees see it as a whole. You know, so as you are sliding on your scale as an individual within your department based on whatever you do, then you are also sliding into the count because the major now you know, like I said, you can do that five percent thing and you know five percent will be the inverse triangle, the inverse pyramid, however you want to call it, uh, or pyramid, however you want to call it, depending on doing your ratings. But you wouldn't that wouldn't be something that you could necessarily do you know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years in a row. Because you would, you would invert eventually. You know, it's it's one thing to bring everybody closer together and then scale along as a group. It's a whole other thing to. But it's one thing to separate everything around. Right. Separation we cannot sustain because once we quit losing those high end employees, we cannot sustain to continue those. We were able to give those for a few years because we had a lot to give. We wanted to reward the employees that have been there. But that's that's also with inside inside of your office. Yes, inside. So that that's the that's the deal. That's for your capital. And then your, your theory is that if you need to read your cap, if you are able to, to pay your employees um, or they can retire, then they retire out. That frees up uh, you know, a 20-year, 30-year employee salary. And then that's what you can, you know, you can break down to the three employees or two employees to pay the But that's, you know, the, there has to be multiple steps. It's not something that we can solve directly at the county level by, by just saying, hey, we're going to give everybody Five percent every year for the next twenty years. It's it's going to have to be a hey office holder. This is a conversation we need to have with you. If you're a group, yeah, you know maybe the first two three years we we bump you up, and then you know there may be a year or two year gap where we just do a, a cost of living or, or something of that nature. But there has to be a plan in place, and it, it's going to have to. You know, it's all going to depend on your office. That's exactly. I mean, like if, if we do the two percent, the two percent just goes back into the salary line of that office holder. But it's up to that office holder to disperse that two percent on an honor basis. The office holder is not obligated to do that two percent. That office holder may decide that this person, we're not going to hold on to this two percent until I accumulate another percentage on top of it, and then we're going to give our raises in our office. Those are the type of things. Once again, the office holder is complete control of their budget. I mean, what we do at this level, well, you know, to some extent, yeah. Or, as far as dispersing the raises once they're I don't know dispersing, but how yeah. they get their money is yeah. still at the table. I mean, if, if they want to, if we get down to it, we have to work with a plan that they want to do. Start using red minuses to read their attention when we next stuff. I think most all of us are in agreement that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that, I think that's consensus across the board that I don't think that's the problem. I have a couple comments to make. As far as the general fund goes, if you'll turn to this total sheet, total sheet of estimated revenues and appropriations. Right 
And the last column you'll see the 2019 20 budgeted figures. If you come down to the bottom, change the fund balance is currently 289 330 out of balance. Changed today because the uh, jail changed their estimate for the uh, outside of medical care for the inmates. So, hope all in all, I mean, the general fund is in good shape. I mean, that's, that's a fully funded budget, is what, what it's been requested. So, uh, much better than last year. Where that, where that came from, I really looked, took a hard look at the all the revenues. And in the past, they had been under budgeting, just to build up to a more realistic figure. And did adjust down the sheriff's department and the jail sum to a more realistic amount for their appropriations. And uh, you know, as I said, as it currently stands, 289, 330. Well, I mean, we can certainly cut, of course, <laughs> well, there is room to cut also, which is not a clue to this, is the outside agencies, which are really some high numbers there, but they really jacked up those numbers. So, but, but certainly, I mean, anything can, can be cut, any of these budgets you see here that have been presented, there's, there's certainly some cuts that can be made. Uh, but then once, once you get to two and a half, you know, kind of, if that's what we decide to go with, we get that ironed out. Uh, you'll see that there too. Yes, right, right. And, uh, another thing that we aware of is the general debt service fund. Its estimated revenues exceed the appropriations by about 125000 So there's some money if, if you chose to uh, to put that in the general fund yeah. budget. Oh, and the general debt service fund, 51, the revenue, estimated revenues for 1920. Will exceed the uh, appropriation by about 125000 For the 2020 budget, is what you're saying. What, what would be our option? I mean, obviously, we always have the option with the reappropriation of those pennies. So, what would be our option as far as debt that we have that if we decided not to, we made our cuts or we done whatever we needed to or took a little bit of money or whatever? I mean, what are our options as far as paying down some of our debt? But it is, uh, there's no penalty for early payment. Correct. We get out low enough, and even with the raises, the insurance company kind of lower, we end up, after the judge, we still have a negative, we potentially lower the tax rate. That's a, that's a possibility, I'm sure. I mean, a realistic possibility. Well, we've done that, and I think it was, I don't know, 2012, it was like, uh, two, I don't know what it was, 257, I mean, it's higher than what we got now. At the very least, I would be kind of say, at the very least, one of the things to work for is, you know, start making additional payments and some of those, some of those additional revenues that come in to, to pay down a bit. How much current debt do we currently have? Our current road? 17 million, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're talking about a payoff of jail. Yeah, we can't pay down any of the jail till 2021. 2021. Yeah, that's the end. Well, two, you've got to consider too, your school coming in. Yeah. I guarantee there has to be a bill at some point. Sure, they're not that naive. Sure. They are. Of course, we've discussed debt and service. That'll be coming up Monday. I'm talking about all this in detail. Ross, sir. One question. If I go back to the uh, comparison of estimated revenues and expenditures uh, with the 2018 19 budget that's. Uh, I think it would be very helpful, Brad, if we had. What uh, a third column, at least a third column, is write down or tally what is being asked in the general fund budget this year. Now, is that page one of one of the fund? Yes. 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 Okay. Because it, a lot of us who aren't on the budget committee, maybe some of our fellow commissioners, this sheet's not going to make a lot of sense to me. 
because they'll want to look to see, well, how much are people asking for this year? How many pennies is that? And what is the variance from previous years? Well, Greg, I think on one of the sheets you passed out to the budget committee group earlier, it does break down the end of the contract. Yes. No, 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 no. Well, that's all we've got to say. I think that's that first thing. Yeah, what you said. Yeah, there. yeah, it kind of tells what's been added. This is broken down like that. Yeah. That's why did you not get that attachment? I wasn't sure. I checked. I double checked my emails. It's okay. Go eventually. Actually, we're glad you did expenditures from Bureau Fund Report. It's actually got the comment saying the VA. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between budget and amendment and then the percentage of change in the comments on the side. Yeah. And we can take this out to you. Yeah, I think it would help for those of us that aren't on the budget committee and maybe other commissioners that don't look at budgets every day what the uh, 2019 2020 request is. How many pennies is that going to be and how does that vary from what we've asked for? Any favors, you guys? It's going to be easier when it comes to the workshop, I'm telling you. Now, what are we going to see here discuss? Are we going to say one or two half a right now? Well, we can't really get no motions. Well, we're driving that. I won't sit here and discuss it. We're going to talk about it. That day, I remember that too. Yeah, it's about it. I think there's no problem with that. We're in agreement with that. Uh, question, Brad. Did you include like the payout that we're going to have to do for uh, like the estimated payouts we're going to have to do for the dry haul project to complete that grant? Did you do a? Did you kind of budget in for the the road that Roger's going to have to basically rebuild and on River River View Road? Or because I think that's gonna I know we got I know we got the matching mm -hmm. funds, but we're still gonna have to shell out like ninety two grand or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. This year, yeah. Yeah. And the dry hollow project requires no matching funds from the county. First utility district is gonna pick up the match grant on that. Cool. Yeah. 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 I thought we put it in a reserve. That was went to a reserve account. He was talking about the radios and all the other things. The other caveat in that was that if we, if there was some emergency. Yeah. That we could withdraw that we could use those funds for other uses. But we did uh, agree with, with the sheriff to let him upgrade his communications, etc. But it was with that provisio in there. Right. And the budget has been amended a couple of times this year yeah. using those funds.
things that are uh, you know, restricted or that we have the garbage counts on. And as those increase, then your, your, farm, you know, your fund balance in those different accounts increases as well. So there's, it's always important to note that you know, as those increase, you know, it, it may bring your bottom line up, but that doesn't mean that those are necessarily monies that are available just to go out to all the solar and things like that. So that's just something to be aware of when people ask the questions during this time of budget season. Yeah. Okay. This, the the uh, fund balance is presented on the, on the summary schedules or as the beginning fund balance. And the ending fund balance from 1920, that just includes the other side of the fund balance, that including those. And that's been the question that I've received, you know, looking at prior years, uh, you know, reports, accounting reports, is your, you know, your fund balance. As it, it's not necessarily the other side, it's the whole fund balance. And then, of course, you, you have a conversation where you break down and, yeah, the unassigned fund balance may have increased, but you know you, you also have these restricted and community accounts that have increased as well. And, uh, there's reasons, there's really, really good reasons for that in some aspects. So, just important to that it is. Do we overall need to be worried about the fact that we did like $4 million in budget amendments over? The, the current budget cycle versus the new one. I mean, I understand a lot of them have gone away and there's some of them coming down, but we still did like over four million dollars in budget amendments. Try to prepare a budget to minimize any budget amendments next year. Of course, if we get any grants or anything of that nature, then we'll have to get the budget. But we've uh, we worked real hard on getting getting an idea of what's coming up next year. So we will include in the budget, not amend it. Have 20 out of their month to be in. Yeah. You moved all things around to make more sense that at least may have helped. Well, that's something that we've always asked for. So I'm going to this in many years, you know, trying to clean up, you know, well, what's, each other, what's this other, you know, what, what is, what's the other? We believe, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's all we've really been doing. I was going to make you a new of an excellent job to give us good data to look at. Anything else? I say we'll uh, keep it recess. Of course, we got another one coming up Monday night. Uh, we will be dead service, highway department, and education. What that is? It's Monday. It's Monday. Yes, Monday. Yes, Monday.